All right, well, Nick Diaz might already be in Las Vegas, ready to compete as Diaz for the first time since 2015, and that must mean whew, deep breath at UFC 266. Fight Week is upon us. Great to have you with us. It is episode three, officially, of Anecdotes presented by DraftKings. I'm John Anik, and we have got a lot of things coming your way over the next 20 minutes or so as we dive headfirst into all. That is UFC 266, Volkanovski versus Ortega. I will be on the call Saturday night, live on pay-per-view. And my anxiety, as I've said before, is all in the preparation, not so much about the performance and sort of addressing an audience of millions, but I sit here and I look at a 14-fight card. I have prepped seven of the 28 athletes as we sit here midweek. All 28 will be prepped, of course, by Saturday night. We've actually had this rare seven-week gap between UFC pay-per-view offerings. So uh, needless to say, not just for anecdotes, uh, we're all just jonesing to get back at it this weekend for UFC 266. T-Mobile Arena in Las Vegas, which means 30-foot octagon instead of the 25-footer at the UFC Apex, which certainly uh, should not be something that you are dismissive of when you are handicapping fights uh, for this weekend. So today, we will get you all of the pay-per-view main card odds. We will also get some Twitter questions for you in q and later in the segment. And where is my action coming up in week three of the NFL? All of that coming your way here shortly. We begin, though, with main event mathematics. And I want to get to one preliminary fight of note before I get to the pay-per-view main card odds. Won't do too much of the Boston accent today of that, I can assure you. But one prelim of note. So Dan Hooker out of New Zealand, perennial lightweight contender, top 10 guy. Minus 150 right now on DraftKings Sportsbook against Nasrat Hakparast, who is plus 130. So there's an interesting handicapping angle here. Dan Hooker uh, is stuck in New Zealand. He has gone to great lengths to try to get out of New Zealand, hoping to arrive in Las Vegas on Thursday. Um, That will get him out of a lot of media obligations, but obviously it compresses his travel schedule. And if you are betting that fight between Dan Hooker and Nasrat Hakparas, again, I'm not betting the fight. I'm just telling you to not include that angle in your handicap, uh, I think is ignorant, right? I think you need to take a long, hard look at what Dan Hooker's fight week is going to hold. Now, he has fought the better strength of schedule. He is the perennial top 10 guy, has fought the best fighters in the world and has had big success against them. Biggest win, probably a knockout of Gilbert Durino Burns, who is now one of the best welterweights in the world. Um, but man, I think it's asking a lot for Dan Hooker to get to Las Vegas on Thursday and beat Nasrat Hackbrast on Saturday night. Uh, but if anybody can do it, it's Dan the Hangman Hooker. So I think that's an interesting angle. And I will tell you, at least as far as the DraftKings number is concerned, minus 165 48 hours ago, minus 150 now on Dan Hooker. So you have seen some movement towards Nasrat Hackbrast. All right. Pay-per-view main card, five fights. We begin with a women's flyweight opener, Jessica Andrade, minus 280. Cynthia Calvillo is plus 225. Andrade entrenched about a three to one favorite here. She's a former UFC strawweight champion. Now trying to make another run at 125 pounds. She did fight Valentina Shevchenko for the title earlier this year. It did not go her way. All right, at heavyweight, Curtis Razor Blades, minus 320. Jarzinho Rosenstrike is plus 250. Heavyweight MMA, right? Obviously, anything can and does happen. Curtis Blades gets a lot of respect from the odds makers, and rightfully so. He was in a similar range, if I'm not mistaken, actually, maybe even a little bit higher, for his fight against Derek the Black Beast Lewis, a main event back in February. Now he's minus 320 against another power threat in Jarzinho Rosenstrike. Granted, this is a three-round fight. Uh, That fight against the Black Beast was a five-rounder. But I can understand why people would be on both sides of this. Again, movement, albeit slight. uh, Curtis Blades from minus 305 to minus 320, and Jarzinho Rosenstrike from plus 240 up to plus 250 in the last 48 hours. All right. The fight everybody's talking about, Robbie Lawler and Nick Diaz, they fought in 2004 at UFC 47, and this is a rematch now that will take place several years later, of course. First meeting went to Nick Diaz all the way back in the day, but I think you can really throw that meeting out. It's minus 110 on both sides. So 48 hours ago, Robbie Lawler minus 115, Nick Diaz minus 105, some movement towards Nick Diaz, and I think that is to be expected. It is amazing to me, though, that a sharp better with respect to the squares out there. Cause I'm pretty square with a lot of my tendencies. When I talk about sharp betters, I'm not necessarily classifying myself as one, but I just don't know how as a sharp better, you could walk to the window and bet on Nick Diaz knowing that he hasn't competed since 2015. And even if you think ring rust is just a figment of people's imagination and that active competition 
or lack thereof is not going to be a factor in the fight. You know, Nick Diaz hasn't won a UFC contest since 2011. And even though Robbie Lawler's current form tells you on paper that he's lost four in a row, he's had seven UFC fights and accrued a lot of rounds since Nick Diaz has last competed. So for me, there are just a lot of unknowns and a lot of variables in this fight, and perhaps that's why it's a pickup, right? Uh, what version are you going to get from Robbie Lawler? I mean, all indications are that both guys are working exceedingly hard. That fight would be a layoff and enjoy for me uh, if I was even contractually allowed to bet on it. All right, so the co-headliner, and again, Valentina Shevchenko, prohibitive would be the adjective I would use, minus 1375. I don't know how fat your bankroll is out there, but Shevchenko, minus 1375. Lauren Murphy is plus 800. Lauren Murphy is as well coached and well trained as it gets. Um, but there's a gap in skill level, talent, and finishing ability here. And the odds suggest that, you know, what can Lauren Murphy do um, to change what is perceived to be myriad disadvantages in this fight? Well, she could certainly go for broke, right? She could do a suicide mission. Suicide mission, I should say. We'll clean it up for Saturday night, but. Suicide mission a la Derek Brunson against Robert Whitaker, perhaps. You know, I think she's going to stay true to her guns and try to fight her fight and be patient and pick her spots and not do something that just throws caution to the wind and doesn't mitigate risk at all. But I do think that Lauren Murphy, despite the current form, five consecutive wins, uh, would appear to be up against it as a plus 800 underdog in her first shot at an undisputed UFC title. And then the main event, which I expect to command two-way action. Uh, I've heard handicappers very convicted on both sides of this. UFC featherweight championship fight, Alexander Volkanovsky minus 160, Brian Ortega plus 140. So Volkanovsky's won 19 fights in a row, trying to make it 20 in a row. Perhaps not enough is made of that because a title defense against Max Holloway was a fight that most experts thought Max Holloway won. Um, I wouldn't put an asterisk on the winning streak of Volkanovski per se, um, but a lot of people felt like Holloway beat him. And Brian Ortega, if you are judging him on his last fight, a main event domination of the Korean zombie Chan Sung Jung, then he's worthy of a second shot at the UFC title, even though he only had to produce one win to get it. So those are your main card odds and a lot more coming up, of course, on DraftKings and our social media channels leading up. To fight night, and as you know, UFC 266 is coming up fast and furious. DraftKings Sportsbook, the official sports betting partner of UFC, has a knockout offer for this weekend. And how about this? They're up in the ante a little bit this time around. DraftKings offering new customers $150 in free bets instantly if you bet just $1 on any fight before the main event. So pretty simple. You bet just $1 on any UFC 266 fight, and DraftKings Sportsbook will give you $150 in free bets instantly. And if MMA is not your thing, a lot of different options out there on DraftKings Sportsbook. Odds and propositions, promotions on football, golf, and so much more. My golf handle is getting like out of control. I got to slow it down here. I think the Ryder Cup's coming up. Uh, DraftKings, safe, secure, reliable. Perhaps the best part is that you can deposit and withdraw your cash literally whenever you want. So my 10-year anniversary with the UFC is coming up in October of this year. And I'm telling you, to a woman, to a man, UFC 266 this weekend, as good a pay-per-view as we can put forth. And we don't want you to miss out on all the action and getting your own action for UFC 266 with DraftKings Sportsbook. So what do you need to do? You download the DraftKings Sportsbook app right now. Use promo code ANIC when you sign up to receive $150 in free bets instantly if you bet a dollar on UFC 266. That's code ANIC, A-N-I-K to receive $150 instantly only at DraftKings Sportsbook. Must be 21 or older, New Jersey, Indiana, or Pennsylvania only. Other restrictions apply. All right. Great responses for Q and Anik this week. Thank you all for chiming on Twitter at John underscore Anik. Let us bring in the executive producer of Anecdotes. I don't know if you have executive privileges, actually, at this point in time. Our producer is Cody Merrill. We'll drop the executive, at least for this week. We'll see what Kyle and the bosses have to say. But it's time for Q and Anik. Rapid fire questions fired at me from producer, courtesy of the Mixed Martial Arts Masses. Cody, how are you? Overlooking that introduction from at huh. Corey Rules. Which fight are you nervous about at UFC 266? I'm still having flashbacks of the last time Curtis Blades was knocked out. So that's interesting, Corey. And again, I think for Curtis Blades, there's a lot of pressure on that young man this weekend, right? Given what happened in that main event against Derek Lewis, entrenched once again, as we said, as a three to one favorite. So 
we develop a lot of relationships with these athletes as commentators. And more often than not, I have a personal relationship in the blue corner and in the red corner, whether it's with a coach, whether it's with an athlete. And one of those fights is Jessica Andrade versus Cynthia Calvillo. I have called almost Andrade's entire career, and I know Calvillo exceedingly well. And I guess I'll just talk to the pressure that I think is on both of those women in the pay-per-view opener. So Calvillo, like, this has got to be it. You know, this would be the biggest win of her career. She puts a lot of pressure on herself. She has left no stone unturned. She seems to have a renewed focus. This is a fight she's got to have. So I'm nervous for her. And for Jessica Andrade, one of the most accomplished women in UFC history, but that was an underwhelming performance against Valentina Shevchenko in a title fight that a lot of people expected to be far more competitive than it was. So pressure on both sides. I'm a little bit nervous to see how that one goes. Cody Merrow, who's next? From at MMA L-O-T-N. You had only been commentating with the UFC for three years the last time Nick stepped into the cage. Interested to hear your thoughts on his return, especially with the dream matchmaking for this weekend. Also, if time permits, is there any advice that 2012 John Anik would give 2021 John Anik? Yeah, a lot of advice, a lot of advice. You know, I think my skin was thick enough in 2012. Now it's super thick, but uh, a lot of advice for that young version. But I guess in terms of the first part of your question, which will probably be more applicable to this audience. So I've never had the chance to call a Nick Diaz fight. I was able to do one pay-per-view for like the movie theaters for UFC, I think 143, uh, early part of 2012. But I'm so excited to see him make this walk for starters right i don't even have to look at the fight card to tell you he has the red corner against a former undisputed ufc welterweight champion robbie lawler so um again when you talk about the biggest superstars in modern day mixed martial arts right and i think these are quantifiable by most metrics right you have conor mcgregor Nate Diaz, Jorge Masvidal, Nick Diaz, Israel Adesanya, and then on down. And if I have notably left somebody out uh, like a John Jones, I apologize, right? Um, But Nick and Nate Diaz are firmly entrenched when it comes to the star power in the UFC's top five. So really excited to see him make the walk. And I think curious as the rest of you are as to which version we will see of Nick Diaz here against Lawler. From the Big Monty, is it crazy that Diaz versus Lawler is near even money? I see Lawler having a massive advantage due to his activity. Yeah, I mean, we talked about that a little bit earlier, right? I just think it's interesting that this is a pick and fight when one guy has been in a relatively active schedule and one guy hasn't competed since January of 2015. You're talking about a near seven-year layoff, and yet money is moving towards Nick Diaz. So, Cody Merrow, what do I know? I know that you have a 209 tattoo and staying in that area code. Con of Combat asks, if Nick Diaz wins, who would you like to see him fight next? Well, I think it's a similar narrative for Nick and Nate Diaz both, especially coming off a win, right? Like, who does Nate Diaz fight right now? Anyone he damn well pleases. Maybe it'll be Vicente Luque. If Nick Diaz wins, I would love to see him fight Jorge Gamebred Masvidal uh, because I just think there's a history there with Masvidal fighting Nate. And I think it stands to reason that Masvidal and Nick Diaz, two of the best boxers in the UFC, uh, could put forth a really competitive show. I don't need a BMF belt on the line per se, but Nick Diaz, Jorge Masvidal, uh, nobody's complaining of that, I can assure you. From Murray, 1979, Randy. If Ortega wins, does Max Holloway automatically get a title fight? Yeah, I mean, I think that makes sense. But of course, Max Holloway is in line to face Yair Rodriguez in a main event on November 13th. If Holloway is anything close to the guy who beat Calvin Cater last January, then he'll probably get through Yair Rodriguez, who is special in his own right, Um, a truly elite fighter. But again, I've said this repeatedly, maybe not to this audience, what Max Holloway did in January of this year, singularly for me, the greatest performance that I have seen Octagon side. So couple that with the fact that a lot of people thought Max Holloway beat Volkanovski in the second meeting. If he beats Yair Rodriguez, of course it would be case closed, but injuries and other things can rear their ugly head. Max Holloway on paper right now is deserving of the winner, whether it's Ortega or Volko, in my opinion. John, Bird Chargers wants to know, what is your favorite era of MMA? Favorite era of MMA. It's certainly fun to go back and watch some of the early fights. I remember watching UFC 1 and UFC 2 in the early 90s, but then I didn't come back as a fan until I think UFC 50 or so in 2004. 
a lot of people will point to past eras like Anderson Silva, George St. Pierre, John Jones, eras of dominant champions. I think in a broader sense, dominant champions are really great for sport. You know, I'm a, I'm a Bostonian, right? But everybody hates the Patriots. And I think that can be good for sport. Um, but I guess for me, it would have to be the modern era. And perhaps it sounds like a cop out answer. But when you talk about the marquee divisions in the UFC right now, Bantamweight, Featherweight, Lightweight, Welterweight, right? And I guess you could include middleweight, but our wheelhouse, those middle divisions where most of the truly elite talent resides, the top 25 in those divisions is absolutely absurd on paper. You have guys ranked number 21 in the world who on any given Saturday night could be competitive against guys ranked number three and number four. So might sound like a cop out answer, but it's the modern era for me without a question. From Pentameter nine, I know you don't bet on UFC due to your job responsibilities, but do you ever bet on other promotions like PFL or Bellator? Contractually prevented from betting on mixed martial arts and boxing. So I can't even bet on boxing right now, I believe. I do like Tyson Fury against Deontay Wilder, but uh, that's just a lean for the mass, right? That's what we call a lean. Cody, what do you got next? From at Sealsy Lad, do you think Volkanovski weaponizing pace and utilizing a surprising reach advantage will be his key to victory? as clinching Ortega against the cage is dangerous and takedowns are very risky, taking away a large part of Volkanovski's game. Yeah, it's a good question. I've heard a lot of people wonder aloud what Volkanovski is going to do because of all of the perceived dangers from the challenger, Brian Ortega. I haven't heard a lot of people talk about Ortega being mindful of the Volkanovski power coming back his way. Perhaps Ortega is not going to worry about the takedowns because of his chokes and his guillotine, his acumen off of his back. Um, but Volkanovski certainly knows what he's doing, right? He is an intelligent fighter first and understands how to put himself in position. Uh, Ortega has been hittable at times. You know, I found out earlier today from a handicapper that Brian Ortega has actually been outstruck on paper in six of his nine UFC appearances. So I do think there are opportunities for Volkanovski, but in a long winded way, I'll tell you, yeah, I think he might be less inclined to go for takedowns. I think you're going to see Volkanovski strike, but he's done a lot of that of late. But I do think it'll be uh, a kickboxing match uh, strategically from Volkanovski. We'll see. From MMA Every Day 2, who is your favorite Australian fighter on the roster? Oh, favorite Australian fighter on the active roster. So that eliminates the lead horse, Mark Hunt, whom I absolutely love. Um, it's hard not to say Robert Whitaker, even though he was born in New Zealand, because he and I go back to 2012 on tough smashes. But I got to say Jimmy Crute. Gotta say my man Jimmy Crute coming off a tough loss to Anthony Smith in which he got injured. But Jimmy Crute's a dog, man. Absolute dog and... uh when I saw the question just before we started today, Jimmy Crute was the first name that came to mind. Bendigo Bombs. I hope I'm pronouncing it right. Jimmy Crute's the answer. The Baines MMA wants to know, why is Volk so underappreciated? He is, right? Guys won 19 in a row. I mean, do you remember when Khabib Nurmagomedov had that winning streak, right? how that was promoted. And I'm not saying it's any lack of UFC promotion. It is only the second title defense for Alexander Volkanovsky. And he doesn't necessarily have the UFC knockout highlight reel uh, that some other fighters have. Um, I think if he can get in a more regular training or I guess not training, but fighting schedule where he's competing every three months, that would serve him well. I mean, I think the best way to resonate with UFC fans, right, uh, is to compete as actively as possible and to finish fights. So if he could get in there every three months, I think that would serve him well. But again, in Australia, New Zealand, in this climate, it's been a lot to ask of these athletes coming back and forth on the quarantine and everything else. Um, he's not underappreciated amongst his peers. I can tell you that. From Kevlar 57, I'm struggling to care about the two title fights, but I'm perhaps too excited about the return of Nick Diaz. Does that make me more a fan of spectacle than sport? Well, it's interesting, Kevlar 57. I think it's okay to like both. I mean, do you lean more spectacle because you can't get excited about Volkanovski Ortega? Like, I'm jumping out of my skin for the UFC featherweight championship fight, and I'm excited to see what Lauren Murphy can do with the opportunity. Maybe I'm a little bit too close to it, but maybe this will help you navigate when there's a title fight that you're not just jonesing to see. The most exciting part of my job is when a fighter 
is either competing for the belt for the first time or breaks through and becomes a first time UFC champion. So Brian Ortega has never had a belt in the UFC and neither has Lauren Murphy. So the opportunity for both of those athletes, is very exciting. The opportunity for, for Volko to win 20 in a row and sort of not capstone, but sort of highlight this title reign with a win over Brian Ortega after what he did to the Korean zombie would be huge. So I think it's okay to to be excited about Nick Diaz and have that be the reason why you plop your money down and invite your friends over. I mean, I think I led anecdotes today with Nick Diaz. Um, and I wouldn't get too bent out of shape if you lean more spectacle than sport. I mean, it is the entertainment business at the end of the day. It's both. It is. John, the last question using hashtag anecdotes. Is Guys are hitting Jay me hard Noose. today. Jeez. What do you got? Why can't Americans say Craig or Mirror? All right, this has got to be from Australia, right? So we have a UFC light heavyweight contender. His name is Paul Bearju Craig. They say Craig. If it's not Scottish, it's crap. You remember Mike Myers on Saturday Night Live? Nope, my producer was born in like the mid-1990s. So the Aussies got on me. Oh, excuse me. Paul Craig, Scottish. This has got to come from Scotland. I apologize. It's not the Aussies. It's the Scots, right? If it's not Scottish, it's crap. Anyway, Paul Craig. So the Scots got on me for calling him Paul Craig because I think us Americans, we say Craig. And I think if you asked an American whose first name was Craig, he might say it's Craig and not Craig. But I know a lot of Americans whose first name is Craig and they go by Craig. We know that in Scotland, it's Craig, Mirror, Mirror, Mirror. I mean, I say Mirror. I don't know what to tell you on that one. And that's it for Q&Anik. and Anik. Hope the Aussies don't watch this week's episode. All right, rip up your tickets. Dumbest bet I made over the last few weeks or so. So as some of you know, I'm a big Red Sox fan. And so I bet on the New York Yankees almost every day for six months. So you can imagine what happens when they lose seven in a row. And you'd think I'd maybe take a step back, but instead I sort of push the envelope. And uh, again, let's hope my wife doesn't watch this week, but the bookie got paid handsomely after the Yankees lost seven in a row. All right, Annex action. Where will my action be for week three of the national? I don't like when people say national football league all the time it's a crutch because you're trying to say something other than nfl i get it i try not to say ultimate fighting championship i try to keep it to ufc all right annex action where will it be for week three in the nfl by the way last time we filmed anecdotes we did give you uh on the pga tour mexican-american abraham answer to win the fedex saint jude invitational uh, he cashed at 35 to one. So maybe we've established a little bit of goodwill if this play does not come in. If you are playing the Thursday nighter, I'm probably going to have the Houston Texans plus seven and a half right now, home to the Carolina Panthers. Tyrod Taylor ruled out with a hamstring injury. That number might get to eight, but I do like David Cauley, the new head coach of the Houston Texans. Short week for both teams, of course. Uh, Davis Mills, I think the backup for the Texans. I will be taking the points on Thursday night. Um, but my bet is actually going to be on the New England Patriots laying a field goal home to the New Orleans Saints. I never bet the Pats. I like the scheduling spot. I don't think the Pats are looking ahead to uh, TB12 and the Buccaneers. This is a game they got to win. Again, it's hard to really know what's going on in the NFL, right? Saints all the rage in week one, stinker in week two. Will they rally here in week three? I don't think they're going into Gillette Stadium and beating the Patriots. It's a field goal right now on DraftKings Sportsbook. I'll cover my eyes when I do it, but it's the Patriots minus three for me in week three in the NFL. If you enjoyed this week's segment, let us know on Twitter kindly with your questions and comments. Hashtag is anecdotes, and those will all be considered for future episodes. Also, you can follow DraftKings on social media at DraftKings on all channels. For the DraftKings Sportsbook, at DK Sportsbook on Twitter. And on Instagram, it is at DraftKings underscore Sportsbook. And of course, we are just getting started, folks. All the UFC 266 coverage you can handle from DraftKings coming up throughout fight week. We'll have fast finishes. My odds boost coming up later this week on my Instagram page. That is at John underscore Anik, J-O-N underscore A-N-I-K. And of course, a new episode of Anecdotes in advance of UFC 267 live from Abu Dhabi next month. Hope to see you all on pay-per-view Saturday night. It's a big one. UFC 266, Volkanovski versus Ortega. Until next time, I'm John Anik. Thank you all for watching. Don't text and drive. Go back.